Uh, my name is Stephanie, and I am the Membership Relations Coordinator here at Population Connection. I want to thank you all for joining us for our new demography series. Today's presentation will be the first of four sessions, so look out for a follow-up email tomorrow with more information on how you can join the next session. And then if you have any questions you want to ask our speaker, please drop them in the Q&A box found at the bottom of your screen, and we will get to those during the Q&A session. Uh, and at this time, I'm thrilled to introduce uh, Hannah Evans, our senior analyst who will be hosting these educational sessions. Hannah runs the Population Studies for Higher Education program here at PopCon, working with college level students and professors to integrate population studies back into the mainstream. She develops and gives solution oriented presentations that examine some of the root causes of population growth and highlights the interconnections between poverty, marginalization, women's rights, and environmental pressures made worse by climate change. Hannah holds a BA in environmental policy and political science and a master's in political ecology from San Diego State University. So without further ado, I'd like to kick it over to Hannah. All right, thanks Steph. Can everybody hear me okay? We're good? Yeah. Um, hi, thank you so much for joining today. As Stephanie said, we're really excited to kick off this uh, spring series on population and the environment um, today with an introduction into demography. So um, we're going to be talking a lot about kind of the basic uh, academic foundations from which we derive a lot of our um, work in terms of our mission and values um, and in terms of our ideologies overall. Um, go ahead and do the next slide. Um, so I'm just going to get uh, quickly into it. As Stephanie mentioned, I'm hopefully going to be speaking for about 30 minutes, not longer than 35, um, at which point we're going to open it up for discussion. And I'm going to have with me on the Q&A uh, section, Marion Starkey, who's our VP for communications. Um, so we're going to be uh, facilitating the discussion in the Q&A, and we look forward to a lively discussion. So if you do have things that you want covered or questions, please feel free to voice them in the chat. Um, just quickly before we get into the, the first series, I just want to introduce our organization, um, just for those of you who are not familiar with Population Connection. So Population Connection is a US-based nonprofit organization that advocates for increased US funding for family planning programs internationally. Um, so we do a lot of advocacy and policy work surrounding the, uh, the security of reproductive rights, primarily internationally, but also domestically. And a lot of our work outside of that focuses on uh, education and outreach, uh, specifically surrounding population and its effects on various social, economic, and environmental indicators. Ultimately, we advocate for advancements in health and education worldwide because we recognize that it's very vital for addressing human rights needs, but also um, really essential for solving climate change and uh, facilitating sustainable development. Next slide. And so this week, we're starting an educational series on population and the environment. Um, with a focus on demography and the role that population studies plays and more accurately understanding and successfully realizing um, our goals as a global society and expanding human rights, sustainable development, and as I just said, solving climate change. And the idea for this series came from the fact that as many of you probably know, there's been a lot of coverage in the news lately about you know, varying population projections and what they mean for the future in terms of climate change, the global economy, geopolitics, and inequality. Next slide. For example, in a seemingly sort of strange turn of events, we're now seeing China, which is the country famous for its one-child policy that was implemented in the 1980s as a, a basis for slowing the country's population growth rate, um, now attempts to increase its population via policy changes that, for example, allow families to have three children and incentivize childbearing overall. Um, they're also now engaged in efforts to restrict access to abortion and contraceptives and are really promoting the ideals overall of 
bigger families and higher fertility rates, um, while also notably, and at the same time, forcibly sterilizing millions of Chinese citizens of a particular ethnic orientation. Next slide. In India, this is playing out as well to some extent as the country continues to grow and industrialize amidst rapid population growth um, in a prolonged state. Um, and despite the fact that the country's total fertility rate has dropped below replacement level for the first time ever, due mostly to increases in urbanization and advancements in healthcare and education, fears about unsustainable population growth have been given a lot of attention in the media and by politicians. And population control measures are sometimes being argued for um, as a necessary basis and means for economic and, and uh, social s stability, excuse me. However, the corresponding you know, policies and incentives aimed at controlling for fertility are disproportionately prominent and impactful throughout the country's poorest and most marginalized regions to the extent that they are pretty obviously coercive measures. Next slide. In Iran, which is a country that was once considered a success, a success story for reproductive rights because they were able to bring their total fertility rate down from one of the highest in the world to uh, one well below replacement level in a matter of years, and even amidst a really fundamentalist religious influence, they are now attempting to increase their population growth rates by restricting access to family planning in really draconian ways um, and abortion overall. Again, they're doing this in order to augment population growth rates and increase fertility, fertility excuse me. And in Egypt and Nigeria, um, there's a real push to slow population growth rates because they are being identified as being too high for governments to adequately cope and adapt, especially as it relates to climate change, which is progressively impacting things like sustainable development, causing large scale displacement, threatening food security and curtailing the already limited availability of finite natural resources like fresh water, arable land, um, timber and so on. So lots is happening around, a lot is happening around the world um, regard, regarding population growth. And all the while, next slide, um, economists are relentlessly up in arms about the economic devastation that they believe coincides with slower, more stable population growth rates and certainly of declining populations, which is occurring throughout industrialized affluent regions like the United States, Europe, and Japan. It's clear that economists are quite concerned about the future of economic growth and likely also the division of, of power and hegemony that might change, right? And in accordance with demographic shifts and older populations into the future. Um, and this is a sentiment that is of course in stark contrast to those of environmentalists who are warning that population growth in high consuming countries especially will drive the climate crisis into a state of being irreconcilable and alternatively uh, argue that slower population growth should be a welcomed opportunity to uh, adapt and promote sustainability. Next slide. And finally, um, as a result of the pandemic, we're seeing things play out really differently across the world in terms of population. Again, in industrialized regions like the United States, fears about uncertain you know, environmental, political, and economic futures have driven many young people to rethink, delay, or even decide against having children, um, which will, of course, you know, affect fertility rates into the future. While in low-income regions, the pandemic has worsened inequalities and prevented millions of people from receiving reproductive health care and family planning services, um, which has already driven unintended pregnancies up substantially and had reverberating effects um, in terms of keeping you know, children out of school, uh, limiting access to economic opportunity and reducing health outcomes, all of which disproportionately impact the world's women and girls. Next slide. And while it's been really interesting, I think to get to read different perspectives and debates about population issues, it has also, I think, made really clear the fact that this is not only an impassioned and contentious issue, but one also that's fraught with misconceptions, misunderstandings, and copious amounts of misguided and oversimplistic assumptions. It's clear that the issue of um, population growth is deeply personal for many people and intimately connected to unresolved and highly traumatic stories and lived experiences of oppression and coercion that have been felt on massive scales by individuals, groups, and societies. And this makes sense um, when we recognize that population pressures and uh, high fertility rates are a measure and effect of inequality. 
and that the world's poorest and most marginalized regions, you know, have and continue to bear the brunt of policies related to population control, in addition to having already limited and unequal access to dwindling supplies of finite natural resources, and thus the ability to develop. But the fact is population growth is directly related to human development and to social justice and to sustainability and to the environment and of course to climate change. It is a simple fact of life that one of the fundamental underlying drivers of environmental degradation and plant warming, planet warming emissions and ecological deficits is the continued growth of the human population. And despite the fact that you know, birth rates are falling, it is still also true that the number of people added to the world each day is unprecedented in history and unparalleled in its consequences. Our world is becoming more crowded with both uh, people and of, of contradiction, right? There are more highly educated people than ever before, but more people who lack education, more rich people, but also more poor people, more well-fed children and a bigger food supply, but more hungry people overall, more emerging markets ready to reap the benefits of industrialization, but more immediate and life-threatening environmental consequences to this process than ever before. Population is intimately related to the environment, most obviously because it is our partial mastery of the environment that has allowed death rates to fall so significantly as we're gonna get into um, later in the, in the presentation. And the result of this has, has meant rapid population growth, which has fueled environmental damage and social, social injustice. Um, and this is not to say that demographic change is, is bad necessarily, but it's important to understand that population growth puts pressures on natural and social resources. And beyond that, virtu virtually every social, political, and economic problem facing the world today is driven by demographic change of some kind. So understanding population and, and uh, development and the environment will you know, allow us all to have a deeper understanding of how the world works. And all of this is essentially the subject of demography. Next slide, please. So with that, let's start from the beginning. So what is demography? Simply put, demography is the scientific study of human populations. Going a little deeper, it's the study of determinants and consequences of population change and is concerned with virtually everything that influences or can be influenced by a wide variety of var variables, including things like population size, population growth or decline, so how the number of people in a certain place um, changes over time, population processes or the levels and trends in fertility, mortality, and migration that determine population size and influence demographics. Next slide. Also population distribution, so where people are located and why, population structure, how many males and females there are of a certain age in a particular place, and population characteristics, which um, include a wide variety of variables, including things like education, income, occupation, um, and many other characteristics. Next slide, please. So population change tells us a lot about a place and its people and can actually, you know, often drastically changes over time to the extent that the past can end up looking almost unrecognizable to the present. And I think similarly, you know, as we're looking at uh, 1900 figure, figures from 1900, I think 100 um, years from now into the future, we're going to be looking back at the demographics and thinking that they're quite strange as well. Um, so if we look at demography, demography um, and how it's influenced the United States over time, we can see exactly these drastic changes playing out. So from 1900 to 2000, the US grew substantially from 76 million people to 281 million people. But because it didn't keep pace with the overall uh, world population growth, it only accounted for a really a slightly smaller fraction um, of the world's population in 2000 than it had in 1900. Mortality levels also dropped a lot over the century. Um, as you can see, leading to an amazing 30 year rise in life expectancy from 47 in 1900 to 77 in 2000 and almost 70, well, getting closer to 78 in 2020. And of course, uh, the pandemic has influenced that overall number. Fertility has also declined from 3.5 to 2.1 to 1.7, which of course changes the composition of families. This table also shows the distribution of Americans over time and of course a, a trend of westward movement as is shown um, in the population comparisons of Buffalo, New York and Los Angeles, California. 
And it's interesting to note here that the percentage of foreign born you know, population in the United States was actually smaller in 2000 than it was in 1900. Also notable is the past that uh, is the fact that the past was mostly rural while the present and future is entirely urban. The past was young, the present is much older. Education levels per household have also increased significantly older over time. So in 1900, only 10% of the population received a high school degree compared to 80% now. All of this information is really vital, of course, to understanding how human society um, is and how it changes over time. Next slide, please. And in terms of our world, again, pretty much everything is connected to demography. Demography is a force in the world that is linked to every improvement in human well being that, um, that the world has witnessed over the past few hundred years. Children are now surviving at much higher rates, adults are healthier, the risks, the risks associated with uh, childbearing are much lower now and babies are surviving through infancy and into adult, adulthood much more consistently. So the fact that, for example, the United States and, and other industrialized nations are experiencing lower fertility means that women are having fewer, healthier children on average, and that these children are surviving into adulthood. This also means that people, women and men, and a society at large have more autonomy and scope in life. They have more time and money and resources to develop their personal capacities and the ability to build a better world for themselves, for their children and, and for everyone else. Lower fertility rates are also an indicator that societies are able to provide their populations with resources that help them overcome poverty, increase their standards of living and improve their health outcomes. And in particular, it signals the fact that women have access to both healthcare and education, which affords the opportunity among other things to access informed choice regarding their own reproduction. Longer lives and the societal need for less childbearing from women means that families and households naturally become more diverse. So it's important to understand here that changes in family structure that occur over time are not the result of a breakdown of social norms, so much as they are the natural consequence of, of societies adapting to demographic changes of people, you know, living longer with fewer children in a world that is increasingly urbanized um, and where migration is vastly more common than it ever was before. Next slide, please. And so from a more global perspective, it's important to understand that societies respond to demographic change differently across the world, sometimes for the better, sometimes for the worse. And from the, a geopolitical perspective, countries are at different stages of development due to a wide variety of complex factors, that's for sure. But um, you know, most predominantly, this relates uh, really directly to histories of colonization, capitalist expansion, government structuring, and so on. And globally, as many of you probably are well aware, the pace of the world's population growth, um, growth is unprecedented in all of human history. It took all of human history, or up until 1800, excuse me, it took all of human history to reach 1 billion people. Now we're adding 1 billion people to the planet every 12 years. Um, but in terms of where this growth is taking place, it's not happening evenly everywhere, right? Um, the growth uh, that is occurring globally is much more intense in some areas in comparison to others. And in societies that have not been able to address uh, and, and cope with rapid population growth, especially with increasing numbers of young people, the result is almost certainly social, economic, and political instability. Next slide, please. So what does the fact that population growth rates vary significantly in terms of geography mean in terms of their demographic futures? And what do differences in fertility rates around the world have to do with development? Next slide, please. So as you can see by looking at this graph, the majority of uh, the world and that, is, um, that represents the populations that are growing the fastest occur in the least developed countries. So this is where population growth rates are the highest and where fertility rates are the highest as well. Um, this is due mainly to a lack of access to resources like health and education. Also notable is uh, the fact that the majority of the world, and we're gonna get into this, uh, later in the presentation. The majority of the world's population, about 5 billion people, resides in less developed regions or middle income countries, which are still growing very quickly economically uh, alongside um, 
population growth. And this sort of presents problems with regards to uh, climate change and environmental degradation. Next slide, please. As you can see, there's a direct correlation between, between women's educational attainment versus number of children per woman. Next slide, please. Um, as well as uh, fertility rates and poverty. So again, uh, there's a direct correlation between access to resources, socioeconomic status, uh, and the amount of children people are having overall. Next slide. But in terms of socioeconomic development and the corresponding effects on lower fertility, population structures are really predictable uh, most of the time in, in, in ways that allow us to understand how and in what ways societies will progress. And to help us better understand how and why all of this is happening, we can take a quick look at you know, the general trajectory of population and development over time. And as we were talking about before, the developmental process that societies undergo as a means to increase affluence, standards of living and livelihoods ends up involving a shift from high fertility rates to low fertility rates as is depicted here. And again, as women gain more and more access to resources like health and education, and as, and as the society in which they live affords more options for economic growth, women and the population as a whole becomes healthier and more educated. So this means that women choose to have children later and in lower quantities overall. So the transition from higher to lower fertility, which has occurred in, in industrialized regions of the world, including places like North America, Europe, and East Asia, in addition to Australia and New Zealand, um, has meant that the younger population in these places is declining as a fraction of the total population, which in simple economic terms, you know, creates quote unquote holes in the labor force and concerns about who is gonna pay taxes, fund pensions and, and so on for these older populations. And you know, we're gonna get into this later, but one of the major ways countries have maintained a strong economic foundation despite these shifts is through immigration, which is certainly something that we're not gonna spend a lot of time on, but a concept that needs to be better understood, I think. Next slide, please. Um, so this is just depicting the age structures over time in Uganda, which represents one of the most, one of the youngest uh, and fastest growing populations in the world. Um, as you can see, it's still got a very, very young uh, percentage of young people, or a very high percentage of young people. Um, and it's in the process of industrializing. So it's in the process of creating a situation where fertility rates will drop over time through increases in access to resources and affluence overall. Um, this is a really critical point in a country's uh, developmental trajectory, and uh, it can be it can result in um, large scale advancements or it can work to the detriment of societies. Um, and we're gonna get into that more in uh, later sessions. This is just an intro. Next slide, please. Um, so if we look at, again, the demographic foundations for immigration from high fertility, low income countries to low fertility, high income countries, we can quickly identify that many low income countries have demographic issues that actually complement those of affluent nations. Um, in Mexico, for example, fertility has not declined as quickly as mortality, which has resulted in population growth rates that are too high for the economy to generate enough, enough jobs for. Underemployment uh, you know, drives people to seek work, work elsewhere. And the US represents a country that is not only geographically viable, but also one um, with available jobs because of lower birth rates overall. And it's also notable that most of these jobs are you know, low wage. And unfortunately, because of globalization, you know, when wages start to rise in Mexico, companies then shift their production practices elsewhere, um, places to places without labor laws or environmental protections, which doesn't as, at all fix the problems um, of people leaving their homes uh, to immigrate in search of work. And there are, of course, many different, you know, again, complex factors and, and policies which are driving migration. Um, but, but demographic shifts and development do play a huge role and can't be ignored. Next slide, please. And globalization, um, which has facilitated higher levels of connectedness among and between people all across the world has hugely impacted us in good and bad ways. Um, and is something I think that like deserves its own course, right? Um, but overall, it is meant that the uh, it is meant the integration of local and regional economies uh, into a larger world market. 
Um, these processes have also created a lot of inequality, which is also well known, um, primarily through the removal of things like trade barriers, you know, at the expense of local industries. Um, but one aspect of globalization that's really important to understand from a demographic perspective um, is that it is tightly linked to global population growth following World War II. So the, the control of mortality through technology, which occurred through industrialization and which allowed countries like uh, Europe and North America um, to, to slow their population growth rates and their fertility rates. Um, so that happens. And then um, as a result of World War II, uh, following the advancements that came from World War II, which allowed technology to spread to all of these different countries throughout the world, um, um, the dissemination of things like vaccines have allowed death rates to fall significantly, which has caused uh, rapid population growth rates, even amidst countries that have not been sort of uh, developing economically or socially. Next slide, please. And this has had a lot of really, uh, the process of globalization has had a lot of cultural significance too, because these populations were, were also identified as you know, new and potential consumers. Um, thus the spread of you know, American cosmopolitan, cosmopolitanism and consumerism. So as jobs have become more available in developing countries, so too has advertising aimed at young people um, who have been encouraged to spend their wages on products and to sort of uh, embody the ideals of consumerism, just like the, what we do in the United States. Um, this of course includes things like music, food, cars, phones, and a plethora of other things. Next slide, please. And unsurprisingly, you know, none of this bodes very well for the environment. Uh, because of the way that our global economy is structured, consumerism is in many ways the foundation from which our economy grows. Um, and of course, this has been an ideal that has spread very intentionally throughout the world um, and permeated even some of the world's most isolated societies. So the links between population growth and, and the environment are really complex and nuanced. And you can be sure we're gonna get into you know, all of those complexities throughout the course. But it is true that the, the growth of the human population expands the potential for ecological disruption and environmental degradation. And worldwide, as we all know, we're affecting the planet in many different ways. Next slide. Um, and lo and behold, all of these you know, processes have kind of uh, ended up in a situation um, in the situation we have now where uh, climate change is already affecting every inhabited region across the globe. Um, and finally, we're able to say with unanimous consent that humans are causing this, this disaster. And we all know that unless drastic cuts to emissions are made on a global scale, climate disasters are just gonna continue to intensify. So this means hotter and drier heat waves, hotter and uh, drier droughts, mounting sea level rise, more life-threatening disasters for more people. Next slide here. Um, this is just a, a series of graphs that was taken from the IPCC's recent analysis, just substantiating the fact that human influence is contributing to climate change and causing it. Next slide, please. And ultimately, this is a really complex conversation as it always is. Um, and what we're gonna have to contend with is the fact that again, there, there are many different complex and interconnected challenges facing our world today, most of which we have created, right? As we've been talking about just the very structure of our capitalist world economy um, and, and you know, assessing how things have, have uh, grown since the industrial revolution allows us to see that we're pretty much endangering ourselves by the, by the economy that we've created, right? Um, conventionally, we encourage economies of scale, types of production, and of course, consumption. Consumption of fossil fuels that cause climate change, of commodities that are fueling deforestation, of meat, which threatens the, uh, the health of the planet and of humans. Um, next slide, please. And again, you know, we're looking at things on a really big macro scale here. So please understand that I am in no way arguing that population growth alone is a sole contributor to environmental degradation globally. Of course, that's just blatantly untrue and a concept that, that requires more explanation. Um, but for now, I'd like us to just take a step back um, from this heated and polarizing debate on population and the environment and just think about the fact that we have created a system in which human development occurs at the expense of the environment and of ecological systems on which 
we depend for survival, which by the way, never really solves the problem of poverty or of an all too consistent pool of exploited labor. The very processes of industrialization that, that afford increases in living standards, health outcomes, livelihoods, education, clean water, longer lives, and so on, results in increasing stressors on the environment because natural systems and services are extracted from our planet for, for little to no cost, which allows the never ending consumption of cheap single use products and a reliance on non-renewable resources, which have in a really short amount of time caused and perpetuated a climate disaster that has already proven itself to be disastrous and might very well result in the planet becoming uninhabitable for human beings in the very immediate future. This is the underlying problem that we all have to understand and come to terms with and work to confront. Um, and I just wanted us to take a second to think about that. Um, imagine being born into this situation and realizing the world that we've created for ourselves. Next slide, please. So what does all of this mean for us moving forward? Well, for one, environmentally speaking, we need to make some real changes and that's pretty clear um, at the global level as well, including how we produce food and energy. Um, and what we really have to understand from, in terms of demography uh, is that the overwhelming majority of the world's population currently resides in countries that are rapidly industrialized industrializing. Um, we know that the principal cause of climate change is the production of greenhouse gases from the burning of fossil fuels, such as coal, oil, and natural gas. And we also know that the leading drivers of growth and global emissions um, are uh, economic and population growth. Greenhouse gas emissions, primarily CO2 emissions, dramatically have increased in the 20th century and continue to hit record levels of, as the global population grows and industrializes. Um, of course, the world's largest contributes, contributors to climate change are the early industrializer, uh, industrializers, gosh, it's a hard word for me to say today, um, the US, Russia, Germany, the UK, and Japan. Um, next slide, please. Um, but within recent decades, they've been joined by the, two, the world's two most populous countries, China, now the world's largest carbon emitter, emitter and India. Over the last decade, CO2 emissions have fallen in the US and many European countries, even while economic growth has continued. And that doesn't um, assert that you know, we're not a high consuming country or that per capita emissions are not substantial or you know, in need of uh, curbing, that is still very true. But it's just important to understand that it's the process of industrialization that affords the most amount of environmental challenges. And that's what's happening with most of the world's population and countries today. Um, again, about 70% of the world's population currently live in middle income countries that are rapidly industrializing. Um, the Global Footprint Network, which is a great organization that's constantly doing research, assessing the Earth's capacity to regenerate resources versus human demand, um, estimates that 80% of the world's population lives in countries that are running ecological deficits, meaning that they're using more resources than their, than their ecosystems can renew. So as their economies continue to grow and integrate with global markets, increases in living standards and consumption will likely drive up the production of greenhouse gases. And this is also a very uh, important and unjust aspect of both development and the climate crisis, because this means that the very processes, processes of industrialization that have historically facilitated increases in living standards, overall health and economic growth for affluent nations um, now act as environmental threats for which consequences are more immediate and life-threatening than ever before. This is also very unjust because um, of course these populations are not the number one contributors to the problem. <clears throat> so again, you know, one of the many unjust realities of the climate crisis as it relates to demography is the fact that the global population um, or excuse me, is the fact that conventional pathways of economic growth and human development involve processes that intensify climate change and put more people at risk of climate impacts. Next slide, please. And for the poorest people on the planet, the implications are really dire at best. So rapid population growth, again, is most pervasive in the world's low income regions and greatly inhibits sustainable development and climate adaptation. Um, the combined population of the 47 least developed countries in the world 
um, are growing two and a half times faster than the, than the average for the rest of the world. So this from a climate change perspective is putting out millions, billions of people at risk uh, for mounting climate impacts and really inhibiting the, the process of development, which is just going to mean higher growth rates and um, an increasing amount of humanitarian crises throughout the world. Next slide, please. Um, so the bulk of our work outside of the educational sphere for this reason focuses on expanding access to health and education worldwide, especially for women and girls. So we can recognize the demographic advantages associated with this, um, especially for countries that are growing quickly economically, again, alongside high population growth rates. Um, and also the extreme and immediate need for basic resources in the world's most marginalized regions, which are increasingly subject to social, economic, and environmental challenges put forth by a global economy they, they benefit very little from, um, and a climate crisis they did not cause. Um, increasing access to health and education in these regions uh, helps, helps people who are at risk, helps individuals, communities, and societies adapt to a changing climate and it helps build resilience in the, in the face of, of mounting climate impacts. And we'll get into to more of this later. Um, but I think with that, uh, I'm gonna conclude the session. Um, so I hope that all of this information has kind of helped synthesize and encompass the state of the world as it relates to population and the environment. And again, our work is really centered on increasing access to healthcare and education, especially family planning, because we know that this is one essential this is essential from um, a human rights perspective, but also something that greatly helps both people and the planet. So empowering women to make informed choices about their own reproduction holds so much more weight than I think we as a global society give it credit for. And in a macro context, increasing access to health and education worldwide and meeting the unmet need for family planning helps societies grow and advance. Um, it also greatly contributes to the mitigation of climate change, as well as uh, the reduction of social and environmental challenges that are made worse by population pressures uh, and global inequality. And from a climate change perspective, uh, it also build, builds resilience and adaptive capacity. <clears throat> okay, so I think with that, we can open it up for questions. Steph and... Yeah. Hello, everybody. Um, Hannah mentioned that I'd be leading the Q&A. My name is Marion Starkey, and I'm the Vice President for Communications here. And I've got a blurry camera for some reason. I'm trying to see if it'll refocus. Um, so I've collected the question. First of all, thank you for that great presentation. That was really interesting. And you're already getting some nice feedback in the chat. And I'm sure it'll give people a lot to think about. Um, the first question people have is, what's up with the roosters? <laughs> I think we have to address that. <laughs> there have been a lot of comments wondering really? whether you live on a farm. Yes. <laughs> That's so funny because I intentionally put these headphones in. Oh no, we can hear these little loud earbuds. And clear. Really? Oh my. Yeah, I live um I live in a kind of rural area right now, uh, in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I wrote in the chat there are wild roosters everywhere. So yeah, um, and they yeah. do not stop throughout the day, as you might have noticed it's not a morning <laughs> thing it's an all-day thing <laughs> all right well now that we've gotten that taken care of I so I collected the questions that we received beforehand that people emailed in and then I tried to kind of combine them into categories just so we could be efficient um, in answering them so I'm going to start off with questions about fertility just since that was kind of you know one of the demographic um, factors so somebody asked, um, what is the fertility rate for major countries and for the world overall? And I thought I would just paste into the, I, I looked these up before, um, before this presentation started. The, the world fertility rate is estimated at 2.4 children per woman. Um, that ranges from 1.65 children per woman in more developed regions to 3.74 children in the least developed regions. And then I just collected the total fertility rate for the, um, 10 most populous countries. And that's what I'm putting in the chat right now. So there's, that's the answer to that. Um, but it's okay. So for Hannah, how are teenagers, both males and females throughout the world being taught about population issues and how preventing themselves from becoming pregnant while young reduces population growth? I'm not sure that they are, but you might have a different answer. 
Yeah, that's a that's a good question. And I think something that just has to be more specific geographically. And um, I think it varies really widely throughout the world and depends on a whole host of factors, um, including obviously educational regulations as well as access to education and the types of education people are engaged in and things like that. Um, I think it, I think if we're going to stratify it between like industrialized versus non-industrialized regions, I think that um, in the United States, for example, population studies and the impact that reducing fertility rates or choosing to have uh, fewer children um, has economically and socially is not well understood or talked about. Um, in contrast, I think in uh, higher, higher fertility regions, um, it depends again on lack or um, access to resources, access to education. But I think that there's a lot of different factors that come into play with regards to high fertility, including cultural barriers, um, access to healthcare, a really pervasive kind of patriarchal structure that um, or religious influence that is kind of dictating or influencing to a large extent uh, people's understandings of uh, family and, and what that means. Um, but I think there's a real opportunity for growth there um, for, for people to expand their knowledge about demography and population and how it influences the planet. And I mean, it certainly in, in high consuming countries like the United States, we need to be educating more about this because it's, uh, it's quite impactful. And, um, you know, environmentally speaking, one of the best ways, well, the best way to reduce your carbon footprint as an individual is to choose to have one fewer child. Um, so I don't know if that answered your question. And then just really quickly, I wanted to, to touch on what you had uh, put in the chat, Marian, about mm -hmm. uh, the most populous nations in the world and their fertility rates. Um, I think that that's a good uh, indicator, but also it's important to understand that within countries, and the United States is no mm -hmm. exception to this, fertility rates are a measure of socioeconomic status. And, you know, I didn't touch on this in the presentation, but reproductive rights and are under assault all throughout the world. This is not a low income versus high income uh, problem. Um, so, so even within the United States, fertility rates are much higher in poor and more marginalized regions. And that's true uh, through, throughout, you know, all world regions and countries. Mm -hmm. We're yeah, and there's often out. a pretty large disparity between urban and rural fertility rates, mm -hmm, you know, exactly. due to social norms, but also just pure access um, mm -hmm. to healthcare centers. So, um, yeah, I th and I, you know, to to your point about, um, you know, education about population issues being important, you know, I'll just do a plug for our population education program. It's the only one of its kind, you know, we work with K through 12 teachers throughout North America and nobody else does that um, on population. So it's not a sex ed program. They're not getting any sort of health lessons from that curricula, um, but it does introduce the concepts of, you know, sustainability and population and human geography and rights and equity um, where kids might not be otherwise learning about those topics. So, um, okay. Somebody wrote, if the pandemic has caused the rate of births to slow in the US, why am I seeing so many baby strollers around? <laughs> Gosh, I can't answer that for you. I'm not sure where you're located. Um, but I don't know, Marion, do you wanna do you wanna? Well, I think, one? you know, having fewer children doesn't mean having no children. So that's mm -hmm. all. I mean, people are still having babies just because the fertility rate is down doesn't mean that it's mm -hmm. zero. Yeah, and this, these decisions that people are, are making and coming to terms with, the impacts of that overall um, in terms of fertility rates and population growth won't, won't be seen in, for a few generations. Right. Um, okay, so we, okay, so then this is sort of the, the women's issues, women's empowerment section. Um, is Population Connection working with groups to empower women to feel good about not having children? Can we leverage, leverage our influence to help make women everywhere know there are alternatives to being a mother, to just being a mother? Um, and I don't know, I don't know if you yeah. have any 
Yeah, so we work with, we don't provide direct service. Um, what we do primarily entails education and, as I said, advocacy um, for specific policies that are upholding reproductive rights internationally and domestically to a certain extent. But we do partner with different organizations uh, around the world in Africa, Latin America, um, and now Southeast Asia and South Asia. Um, and these organizations uh, are great and they provide, you know, direct service uh, and sort of on the ground grassroots uh, advocacy and community development um, throughout regions that are impacted by population pressures and high fertility rates and, and most acutely poverty. Um, so what we do is try to, you know, work with them to empower their uh, programs to the extent that they're able to implement community development in the ways that they see fit that are most culturally appropriate and being led by people um, who, you know, live in, in the communities in which they work. Um, it's important to understand that we we are advocating always for reproductive autonomy um, because we can understand from a, from a you know, broad perspective that fertility rates drop naturally whenever women have access to resources uh, and are educated on the ways in which smaller families, as you mentioned in the, in the question, contribute to a, a more sort of stable and sustainable future. Um, but that's not to say that we're trying to you know, influence anyone one way or another. We just know that um, you know, there's hundreds of millions of women in the world right now who want to avoid pregnancy, but don't have um, access to the resources necessary in order to do so and aren't, you know, utilizing resources uh, to the extent possible. Yeah. And that includes the United States. I mean, we 45% mm -hmm. of pregnancies in this country are unintended. Um, mm -hmm. So we have our, our own work to do on that. Yeah, I just... Um, we, we did do an issue of the magazine, of our quarterly magazine, a couple of years ago where we interviewed sort of the preeminent um, child-free researcher. Um, she Her name is Amy Blackstone, and she's a professor at the University of Maine. Um, and she came out with a book, I want to say, in 2019 and was touring it around the country. And um, we, we got in touch with her and interviewed her. So if you're interested in, you know, normalizing child-free life. Um, she's a good person to who, whose work to look at. Um, and, it, you know, we've also actually recently been contacted by several different journalists looking to write stories about women who have chosen not to have mm. children. And I actually spoke with two of them this morning. Um, it's two young uh, journalism students at Columbia University who are creating a documentary on that very topic. So, you know, it's something people are talking about. Um, I, about about a, one in five women in the United States end their childbearing years without having had a, a biological child. Um, that's a pretty high percentage if you think about it. So in yeah. some ways, I feel like it is already kind of becoming a norm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think especially with the with the pandemic, my and um, oh, got a little ring of light here. Oh, here we go. Um, with the pandemic and again, climate change, it's kind of um, acting as a, a shifter of, of paradigms. And I think, I think people are like, you know, re-envisioning what it, what it means to live a, a fulfilling life among other mm -hmm. things. Um, and in, despite whether or not that this is, you know, the cause or this is because of unfortunate circumstances, it's still changing norms and shifting perspectives in ways that, um, you know, allow us to kind of uh, confront um, sort of patriarchal norms and standards. Yeah. Okay, we've got a couple of questions about the climate. Um, mm -hmm. Climate is proving to be a significant factor in the world. How do climate conditions affect demographics? And then a similar question, do demographers consider environmental impacts on births and deaths, global limits? Um, and I don't know if you have a specific answer to this, but I'm reminded of the person that you spoke with a while ago who was creating their own population projections that took environmental uh, mm. challenges into consideration. I don't know. Mm. Yeah, my goodness. Um, I think that it, climate impacts being uh, influencing demographics is really difficult to understand and measure because people are being displaced all the time and moving and, um, you know, climate impacts are so unpredictable, but I think that uh, 
as as we're going to get into in later in the series, and as we kind of touched on today, climate impacts really exacerbate new and existing inequalities that are already present throughout a lot of the world. Um, so if a place is, and if a group of people is, you know, marginalized and lacks access already to basic social services, then climate impacts are just going to um, make that situation even worse uh, to the extent that it could influence fertility rates um, positively or, um, you know, most importantly, be life-threatening. Yeah. Yeah. To my knowledge, though, the, um, the traditional population projections that we're all used to looking at, like from the UN Population Division, for example, do not take into account um, mm -hmm. future environmental challenges that are expected to come yeah. down the pike. Yeah. Yeah. Um, They're based on historical trajectories, which, yeah, mm -hmm. is, and it's a good point that the environment is changing so drastically and certainly influencing all aspects of society. So um, it's undoubtedly going to be impactful, but I don't know if we're sure in, in what ways or exactly how that's going to play out. Yeah. Um, another climate question. Could you mention some of the ocean effects of climate change? such as deoxygenation, algae blooms, extinctions, et cetera. Do you know much about um, ocean? I mean, I, I just know generally, and I probably am not gonna tell you more than you already know, but of course, human activities, uh, in particular industrial agriculture, um, creates a large amount of you know, waste and, uh, and things that are put into streams and waterways that are and that end up being dumped into the ocean um, this causes an overabundance I think of nutrients and oxygen in a lot of uh, oceans and creates I think what's called eutrophication or ocean mm -hmm. acidification um, and which kind of uh, disallows life from existing or uh, proliferating in certain places this has occurred um, for example in um, the Gulf of Mexico off the coast of Texas where I think like a huge a uh, portion of, of the Gulf is um, devoid of life because of you know, all of the different waterways from the Mississippi uh, Delta are just coming down and being spilled into um, the ocean there. So certainly you know, industrial agriculture plays a role in addition to just all of the other sort of industrial processes, uh, fossil fuel production, um, uh, coal, uh, the production of kind of non-renewable resources. Mm -hmm. ultimately has an impact on the oceans. Um, sorry, I can't give you a more technical answer, but yeah, hopefully that- I can't either, but um, yeah, it, okay. Um, and this one, this is something you've talked about in the past. Please give examples of how religious groups influence and mm -hmm. or are ignored by the people. These kind of stories stop people in discussions from blaming faith groups and political structures, focus on keep keeping conversation going. So places like Iran, I'm assuming is mm. what they're talking about. Yeah, and um, to be sure, religion does very much influence uh, access to birth control and whether or not people are going to uh, utilize resources surrounding reproductive care and family planning and contraceptives and things. Um, but what we see overall in a, in a more sort of global context is that really the number one indicator of, uh, you know, the use of contraception is not religion, but, but access. So whenever governments are able to provide these resources to countries and to their citizens, then fertility rates drop regardless of the religious influence. And we've seen this play out in a lot of uh, areas of Latin America. And in fact, um, even in some of the, the most uh, hev heavily like Catholic regions um, of the world, we're seeing um, abortion restrictions being lifted, like in Mexico and Argentina, for example. Mm -hmm. um, and also, this, is, this has happened in Iran, which I mentioned earlier in the presentation. And unfortunately, they've just reversed their um, really progressive policies. But they were able to bring their fertility rate down from one of the highest in the world to one below replacement level fertility, obviously amidst a really uh, heavy fundamentalist influence um, because they made contraceptives freely available and sort of advertised and educated the public about the benefits associated with smaller families. And this is actually what's happening in Egypt right now. So mm -hmm. there's large scale sort of like PR campaigns that are being administered by governments um, to again, kind of educate about the uh, 
the need to kind of shift the the cultural and social norms away from one of having a huge family to one that recognizes the benefits of delaying childbirth and uh, you know lowering fertility rates over over time. Yeah. Okay. I think we've got time for one more question, um, and this is something that I know is near and dear to your heart. heart. So oh. when re <laughs> when reaching out to the public, do you have some advice on how to avoid people immediately jumping to conclusions about population control and eugenics? Um, yeah, that is a constant challenge um, for an organization focused on population studies. And it's something that I kind of covered, you know, in this presentation and I and I often talk about in all presentations because I think it's on people's minds and it's a really contentious subject. And again, you know, there are valid reasons for this where, um, you know, we're not only looking at histories of forced sterilizations and uh, controls on fertility um, that have been imp imposed by different governments. This is not like a past issue as I was talking about at the beginning, you know, this is happening today. This is happening right now and it affects people's lives, right? So. I think we need to acknowledge that, that fact and to talk about the fact that wh whenever we're looking at fertility rates over time and population projections and um, you know the amount of children people are having, we need to be doing so from a perspective of reproductive autonomy. Um, and we need to also recognize that this is something that is uh, greatly representative of uh, global inequality and marginalization. Um, in racial terms and socioeconomic terms and gender terms uh, and geopolitical terms, this is something that is, you know, very important to understand uh, in a complex way. And I think that it, it does require some explanation. So um, I think if, but at the same time, again, like it's a very important subject and something that needs to be talked about uh, more because solving climate change is going to be impossible without addressing uh, population issues and really understanding the underlying causes of high fertility rates. Um, so I think just being open and, and educating yourself and educating others about uh, the histories of population control and how that differs from our strategies now and um, why certain countries are in the situations they're in with regards to development and what can be done. Um, from a country that is and, and a population of people that represents, you know, some of the highest consumers in the world, right? This is sensitive for a reason. So we just need to, it's important to, to be educated and to talk openly um, about it and, and to be willing to change your perspective and, and open to kind of um, discussions that might not be comfortable. That's the name of the game with this job having yeah. discussions that are not comfortable. <laughs> um, okay, well, with that, I want to thank you for giving such a wonderful presentation. And I guess I'll invite mm -hmm. Steph Stephanie, do you want to come back and say a couple of concluding words about what's next? There we go. Hi. Yes, thank you, everyone, for joining us. Thank you, Hannah, for the wonderful presentation and Marianne for facilitating the Q&A. We will be in touch in the following um, day with a recording to this presentation along with um, the presentation slides. So please stay tuned for that email. If you RSVP'd, we have your email on file, so you will receive it. Um, and in addition, we will provide information on how you can join us for the next session in the series. Uh, so thank you again, everyone, and enjoy the rest of Thanks so much. Thanks. Bye. Everyone. Bye. Bye.